Could you give me a little bit of your name and your past and how your grandma especially was into serpent handling and how that brought you into it? Steve Nance, my name's Steve. I was 50 when I got into it. Uh, I had been on the mountains. I've got several altars around that I've been praying it and the seeking the Lord about serpent handling. And uh, I had a dream. I had a dream of um, I went into a church I'd never been before. And when I pulled, when we pulled up in the parking lot, there was people outside everywhere. As I, uh, when I went inside, the, the, I sat about middle ways of the church, and there was a preacher, the, the pastor, got up and, and he laid a big rattler across a pulpit. Just down, and he laid it across the pulpit, and he said, "We believe in serpent handling here." A man got up and come up to where the pastor was out and reached out for it, got it, took it from the pastor. When he went to handle it back to him, it bit him, it bit him on the hand. And I thought I looked up and, and blood was hitting the top of the ceiling there, and he went and sat back down, and the Holy Ghost got on me. It got me up, and I danced right up to it. He had slung that, he had slung that, when it bit him, he slung that rattle, and it went up under a bench. And I thought from my shoulders to the tip of my fingers was in a big giant bubble. And I went up down that seat and took it and walked right over to him and told him it'd go straight through him. Well, about three months later, I was up in Virginia. And I was at a, a friend of mine's house, Brother Jim Long. And Jim said, we're going up to Poor Valley today said there'll be a lot of serpents there. He said they'll be everywhere. We pulled up in that parking lot. It was a dream that come back to me. Same thing. Same setting. Little church up on the hill. There was probably 200 outside handling serpents. I walked in, sat down in the same place where the Lord showed me in that dream. But he told me in that dream, he said, when you feel this, you can handle anything. It'll let you handle the fire. Well, the pastor gets up, reached down, picked up a big rider and laid it across the pulpit. And he said, we believe in serpent handling here. But in my dream, it was a man, but this was a woman, Sister Maddie. She come from towards your back and handed, and he handed her that rattler. When she went to hand it back, it bit her on the hand. And on, she kind of went to the side there, and from the tip of her finger, her elbow had done swelled up, it was that big, it was just solid black. And the Lord moved on me and let me lay hands on that woman, and she come up. But from that day on, I know what it took to handle serpents. I first met Steve Nance a few weeks ago on the Appalachian History Facebook page, asking if anyone still practiced serpent handling. Historians disagree on the true origins of the practice, but it reached its height in the Great Depression, which is when Nance's grandmother was introduced to it. Nowadays, there's a lot of negative stigma attached to it, and most churches that openly practiced it began to do it in secret. After communicating with Steve for a few days, I decided to drive up and meet him. As I made my way west of Chattanooga, I passed through struggling, shuttered old mine towns, passing memorials for men who died in tunnel collapses. I saw folks struggling with addiction, walking crookedly through the streets. It was easy to see how a practice like serpent handling would be adopted in a place like this, a place that's humble, poor in the material sense but rich in spirit and closer to God. I was a drug dealer and on drugs real bad and the Lord I was in Florida living in a big fine home down there and the Lord came to Florida looking for me and got me. I come back home got when I got right and got saved and began to seek the Lord about all this serpent handling and, and the Holy Ghost. It's something that the Lord will show you what it is. He'll teach you. He'll teach you when it's time to get them. And he'll teach you a time whenever you've got, if you're handling one, he'll teach you when to put it up. He'll teach you to lay it down. The Bible says that these signs shall follow them that believe. There's four shalls and there's one ill. I had a, a question the other night that a, that a person said, well, if you believe these, why don't you drink poison? He didn't say you shall drink poison. He said, if you drank anything deadly. And 
if you do if you do research on on something like that, there was a lot of uh, kings and and a lot of people poisoned. Well, the Bible says, and if you drink anything deadly, you know, like if somebody's trying to poison you, or if you get out somewhere or another and drink something with poison in it, it won't hurt you. But the shall, the Bible says, you shall speak with tongue, you shall lay hands on the sick, and you shall take up serpents, and you shall cast out devils. That shall and if is, is two different words. I had seen one argument where they said that that applied only to the apostles. I don't see it anywhere in the Bible that it only applies to the apostles. No, no, no. He, he, said, he said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And those that believe, these signs shall follow. So if he was a talking to the, if he was just a talking to the apostles, if it never was, there's one sign in there that just about the whole world agrees on, and that's laying hands on the sick. That's that's a sign. So why why would why would that be? But. He said, and in in those that believe, he told the disciples to go into the, all the world, and them that those that believe shall take them up, or these signs shall follow. And the Bible says, and they went, a preaching everywhere with a word and confirming with signs of follow. Confirming. So, if if I don't have no, if I don't have nothing follow in my life, how could I, how, how could I, uh, you see? And believe if it's just nothing. Jesus told them there. He said, "If if these signs that I don't do, he said they won't believe." When he healed the sick, he raised the dead. You know, I, I've got a. I, I was raised in a little old town right over here. It's, it's called Checker Town. I was raised over here when I was about seven year old. When I was about seven year old, I, I stepped off the porch, I cut my foot right here. And it cut that main artery in two in my foot. My dad, my dad believed this. He never did get the handle one, but he believed it. His, his brothers did, and his mom and them did. And he was up in the field to plow on the horse, and I sat down. And blood, every time my heart would pump, it pumped blood from here to that door. Just, I mean, cut it. Well, my mother, she had real long hair. She was sitting there brushing her hair, and I hollered at her. I said, Mom, I've cut my foot. And she looked around, and when she seen that blood, she just withered, screamed, just withered out, passed out. Well, they run, got my dad. My dad come down through there. My dad was a faith man. He, we never did doctor. He never did take us to the doctor, and, and he died that way. He wasn't doctor after he got saved. And he come down there, and he just put his hand on it. I'll never forget it. He just put his hand on my foot. And he said, Lord, he said, you give me this boy, but if you want him, you can have him. Instantly, the blood stopped. There was a registered nurse that lived across the road in front of us, Annie the Crabtree. She come running over through our, some of the folks in the community there gathered up. And she said, Amos, said, you better get him up here to the clinic. Said, he's cut so wide, he said, that it'll never heal. Said, when it starts to healing, the meat will come up through the, the cut. He said, Sister Ann said, you've seen what the Lord just done, and you think I'm going to take him to the doctor now? No. Well, he just wrapped it up. <clears throat> it was during school time, and I'd been out of school, and sure enough, when it started healing, my foot was all swelled up, black and blue. And Sister Ann, she'd come over and she said, it'll kill him. said, he's getting poison in it. Well, my dad was working at the nuclear plant that time up Squalia. He, she, he come in from work about two weeks later. He come in from work one day. And Mama said, Daddy said, you need to come in here and look at this boy's foot. Well, we come in there where I was at, and they unwrapped it, and it was all swelled up, black, blue, red streak going up, I think, by, by leg there. And I remember what he said was, he said, we'll wrap it back up. I couldn't walk on it, couldn't do nothing. And Mama had supper cooked, and he'd come in and work that evening. He didn't even eat. 
he went straight to his prayer closet and began to pray. That was about 5 o'clock that evening. Well, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I could hear him still praying in there. Still praying. Well, the next morning, was he got up about 4 o'clock. I don't even know if he ever went to bed. But I know it was about 1 or 2 o'clock when I heard him praying. And he gets up and goes on to work. Well, I get up about 7 o'clock. And I'm left-handed, I'm left foot, I'm left everything. My left foot hit the floor. I thought, oh, I feel good this morning. I feel good. Now this happened. I'm 61 years old, and this happened. And buddy, I went bouncing through the house there, and Mom said, oh, son, what are you doing? I said, my, my foot feels good. I believe I, can, I believe I can go to school. And I'm going to show you. It cut me from right here all the way around. It cut that artery in two right there. The next morning when I got up, it looked just like it does right now. It was slick as my hand the next morning when I got up. That's what God can do. That's, that's your signs. My, my, I've got an older brother. I've got an older brother that's 63. That had, he had a stroke when he was 18. Pulled his face plumb around. I mean, his jaw was from around here. Had to put a, blinded him in one eye, crossed his eye, and had to put a patch over his eye. Daddy come in from work down there one day, and Mama said, Daddy, we've got trouble. I said, what is it? He said, come in here and look at Jim. I said, he's in bad shape. He couldn't even hardly talk. His mouth was all plumb around. We're still talking about the signs now. This is just one of the signs, you know. Well, we know there's five of them, but it works. Daddy said, well, what's wrong? She said, look at Jim. So he goes in there and Jim was all messed up. He said, Daddy, I'm burnt. He said, no, son. We serve a God that's able. <laughs> I get to feel that now, boys, I tell you. It went on there for about a month. He'd had, he'd had to sup, drank anything out of a straw. My daddy was a praying man, buddy. He'd fast, he'd pray. It seemed like nothing going to happen. One day he come in, they was having church down there, and, and my brother come through the back door. He said, come here, son. Come on up here. My brother tell you today, he said, I don't know who laid their hands on me. But he said, when I come to myself, and there's a man still alive today, Brother James Nunley. He can tell you the same thing. He said, Jim, I washed your mouth in slow motion. Just come right around. Never had no better trouble out of that. Wow. I had a baby brother. Now listen, I had a baby brother. that had pneumonia, bad. My dad, wasn't, he trust God. He wasn't going to no doctor. He wouldn't take us kids. And I'm going to tell you why. It ain't out of nothing being big. Here's what he promised the Lord. He said, I was down praying one time. He said, God, if you can save a man like me, you can take care of me and my kids. And he used to tell us when we was getting, he'd say, boys, don't ever make a vow to God you can't keep. Because the Lord will try you. He done tried us, me and my brother. My youngest brother was nine years younger than me. He's still alive today. Caught pneumonia. He never eat a bite for two solid weeks. He was about five years old, and he didn't he didn't eat a bite or drink a drop of water for two solid weeks. That kid didn't. He was dying. Daddy was working up squally again. Mama called him and said, "Honey, you better come home to Sean's a dying." He said, "Okay." Never forget it, but I had just went in there in his bedroom where he was laying on the, on the thing. Like I say, I was nine years older than him. And I reached down to kiss my little brother, and he screamed because there's so much pain in him. My daddy was coming across Sub Creek Mountain over here, and he said, God, please heal that boy. He'd been fasting. He'd come home with blisters in his mouth. It was so hot where he had fasted, begging the Lord to help him. He said, you know, and I'll trust you, live or die for this boy. 
And he said the Holy Ghost come in the truck with him. And he said he healed that boy that moment that he come in that truck with him. When he was about 30 minutes from where he was at, getting home. We live in a big old house right out here. When he pulled up in the yard, my little brother made him at the door. <laughs> oh, Lord, son. You, you, you know, serpent handling is like this. When Daniel went in the lion's den, he closed the mouth of them lions. I'll tell you what, I've been in church before, and the Lord get to move, and we get to handling them serpents, and I guarantee you, you couldn't have took a hammer and opened them snakes' mouth. He'll close it. What the Lord closes, it's closed. I had a brother one time at that 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 the Lord said, Son, said, go up there and try to open that rattler's mouth. And he said, I got that thing by the head. And he said, I was trying my best to open its mouth. And he said, the Lord said, when I close it, it's closed. It won't be no harm to it. But when he met him at the door, my mother said, Honey, he said, about 30 minutes ago, said, I heard him little footprint. He said, Mom, I'm hungry. <laughs> he said, I know. I said, I know it. I know it when the Lord come by. If you live right, if you do right, and you live right, and you go by what the book says, it'll take care of you. <laughs> my grandmother was a faith woman, too. She'd been a praying for my two uncles that was in the service in World War II, and they was on the front line. And at the same time, that same man I was telling you about my father, he was five years old. And my grandmother was rendering lard. Had it in a big old hot pot. And my 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 dad got up on a little old box there and grabbed that pot and pulled it over. And it hit him in the crown of his head and it stripped the meat off of him. I mean it stripped the meat off of him. She wouldn't take him to the doctor, which this was back in the late forties, somewhere along in our early forties. My dad, whenever he died, his legs were just all scarred up everywhere. The big old knots in them, but it never did bother him. On his arm, chest. But she was fasting and praying for my dad to be healed. And she said about three weeks after that, she said the Lord, the Holy Ghost, came into her and witnessed her and told her, she said, he said, I'm going to heal that boy. And he said, I'm going to bring them other two boys home. And he said, they won't have a scar on them. They won't have a first scratch on them. And when they come back here, they had bullet holes through their shirts, through their helmets, through their pants. They didn't have a scratch one on them. And my dad, he lived. That's what the Lord can do, you know. And they was, she'd be picking cotton. She picked cotton a lot and uh, strawberries. We had a big old strawberry patch. She was picking strawberries one day and a copperhead reached out and bit her. She went right through her. Didn't hurt her a bit. You mentioned all these miracles, but I've read that the state governments here make it very difficult. And oh I'm, yeah, they do now. I'm curious about what they've done to crack down on this practice. Well, you know, now then, which now my, like I say, my youngest brother, he's never had no kind of shots his whole life. My dad never took him to the doctor for his school shots or nothing. And they had a little round there with a, with a state, which just was in the 70s. And, uh, but he told them, he said, well, this is my belief. This is what I believe. And they just left him alone. Now then, though, they, they'll come get your kids, you know, if you don't take them and have them for school shots. And why is that? Why do they just work on religious things? You know, which I've raised my kids here, and, and, and I, took them, I took them to a doctor, and I took them to the doctor. They've had all their shots. But I've got a little girl that's 15 years old here, and this is okay. If she says, Dad, I, 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 I want to be a boy, I could take her and have her changed over to a boy and the government, and I've got people that'll back me up for that. But then, 
if I try to raise them right and show them what the Lord can do and how powerful that God is, just like when handling serpents, then they'll lock me up. So that they'd like to try to take you and put you in jail. So here we are living in a world right now where the Bible says it's good is evil and evil is good. You said that the uh, the last sheriff of Grundy County was kind of receptive to serpent handling, or at least allowed it. Well, not that he allowed, but he just he, he believed what the book said. You know, he he told me he said, "Well, Steve, I don't know nothing about it," and I just leave it at that. You know, I mean, he he's kind of he believes that uh, that we ought to have a right to worship any way we should want to worship. You know, whatever it may be, and and. And he never would, you know, which I didn't, I, I don't cast my pearls before the swines, I guess you might say. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't push it on nobody. I go to all these churches. They let me sing and uh, get up and testify, but I, I don't I don't push serpent hunting on nobody. What was interesting to me over the phone, you say you don't push it on anybody. And you described how if I were to walk into a, a serpent handling church, yeah. nobody would hand me a serpent. No, no. It's up to people to go up and handle them no, themselves. No, that's right. No, they would not. Uh, they keep them. They keep them on the stage. You know, uh, I've never. I, it's not a forceful thing. You know, it's just a normal church that you go to, but they just practice that. You know, I mean if. if 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 it spirit comes by, they'll handle them. If not, they don't. Uh, but I, 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 I encourage people to go, to go to a, a right one, not one that people. You got to live right. You got to. It's the same way. If you can't, uh, if you can't live it, you need to leave it alone. You know, you get yourself hurt. But I. Uh, I know brothers that these little propane torches, and they don't lie. You know, I mean, I, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that can handle serpents and get away with it that probably don't even live right. I mean, you know, we see clips of uh, India or wherever, you know, handling cobras and stuff. And, but I know some people, they'll take them torches, just them little red, uh, round torches, Turn them things on, stick them right under their neck, and the flame just go around their head. When that gets on, that's right. And they don't lie. Them, 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 them torches won't lie. They'll burn you. They'll get you every time. Where a serpent may not get you every time. That torch will get you. It, it'll burn you. It'll eat you up. And uh, the Church of God with signs following. Yeah. I believe most of them have been shut down. Is that because yeah. the practice is just dying out, or is it because of the government? Yeah. Well, um, a lot of them has a lot of a lot of churches. They shut down because of the a lot of them getting bit. But there again, there again, we, we're they. I'm the. I don't know why that they don't. Uh, okay, it's just like drinking. I seen I, I seen more this. I don't know the the total number of people that gets killed of drinking and driving a year or whatever. Well, they don't shut the breweries down. You know they still it's still okay for that, but yet people get bit and dies for religious. Uh, they'll shut it down. Well, you mentioned a little bit about uh, when people do get bit and pass away, that that might be the spirit flowing through them, but they're moving too fast. Or I've heard some people say that the church looks down on people who were bit and died, but I don't think that's true from our conversations. You don't no. look down on them. No. Uh, we can all make mistakes. You know, I mean, we can get, uh, get, get, get ahead of ourselves. And that, that's why that we really need to know the teaching of the Holy Ghost that lives inside of that that that'll teach you when and not to, you know. But they've been a lot of they, they yes, they have been people bit and die, you know. And they just didn't wait on the Lord. They didn't wait on that true spirit to get down upon. They might have been feeling good, but 
there's a difference in feeling good than the, the real power that gets on you. And that doesn't make them bad people. That no, 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 it don't make them bad. No, it does not. No, absolutely not. It does not make them bad. I only ask because I've seen people online say, oh, these uh, serpent handlers, they say, well, if you die from handling serpents, then you were bad. But, yeah. I mean, you seem to be a very friendly person. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, you know, just uh, these good people just starting their vehicles today probably got killed, you know. It don't make them a bad person. Uh, it does not make them bad.